And uh, the reason why these invariances exist is because they uh, compress reality in such a way that it becomes controllable. And according to the good regulator theorem, if you want to control something, you need to implement a model of what you control. And I suspect that's the reason why the universe is so surprisingly learnable, because all the structure that you observe is probably control structure. In recent years, when I've read some of this literature, it, it, it seems very natural to me, because one of the, one of the things I did at, at J.P. Morgan was participate in a rich risk management effort, was basically how to control traders to make them make fewer mistakes. They don't deal well, well with probability distributions, particularly the tails and small probabilities. This is a very early experiment we did where we have a participant and, uh, and he feels a stream of real-time data from the internet. Uh, the atoms and molecules are the emergent patterns over the uh, particle dynamics. And, uh, but for cells, it's much more complicated because for cells, you need to have some kind of control system and this, uh, that is looking into the future. And here the complexity becomes so large that you need to stay in the realm of discoverable models. And that means that you need to highly compress what the agent is doing. So you describe it as a single system with a single main concern and all the other concerns of the system being subservient to it. And then two buttons appear and he has to choose one of the buttons and, uh, and he gets feedback. You need to also have classical communication. And what counts as an error then is a discrepancy between what some system sees and what it expects to see based on its communications with some other system. And this is basically Shannon information theory. <laughs> if I'm sending a message across some channel and you're receiving it, the message is noise unless we've already shared some sort of information, like a language, for example, or uh, a language plus some semantic box that the message is supposed to be about. If we share enough, then all I need to do is send a bit. And for safety, I send three bits to give you some error correction capacity. But those three bits only mean anything if, if we've communicated before about what the question is that's being answered. A frowny face or a smiley face, and he doesn't know what's going on here, but uh, he keeps doing it and he hits the buttons. Because I believe there's something underneath. So let me... Uh, so there's, there's a unifying, uh, hopefully a unifying model. I use robotics methodologies, and they have to do with this concept called a configuration space. Because it's like a topological space, like a mathematical thing that represents the sets of states that a system can be in. But it turns out as a designer and analyzer of crypto economic systems, this is what's really at our disposal. What I'm looking for in, in neuroeconomics economics as an economy is really this. It's really some underlying model of what goes wrong with my rationality model at the individual level. What we're doing is feeding in real-time data from the stock market, and he's making buy and sell decisions. I told you I became an animist in recent years, and that's um, not because I think that physicalism is wrong, but uh, because I think that the invariance that we're looking at when we look at living things is the software that runs on regional physics not the mechanism itself. But our current uh, dominant perspective in Western science is that uh, the world is mechanical and we need to explain it in terms of mechanisms. Yet we also understand that, for instance, um, money is not mechanical. It's a software that is only apparent when you have a certain course training that you put onto the world to interpret the world. But also important aspects of the world make no sense if you don't use money as the explanandum. And we're seeing if he can come to have a better sense of the economic movements of, of the planet this way. Back in the 70s, we used to try to use ways to train people to be better. We, we thought this would make them do a better job. And I would say all of this effort in the 70s was hopeless. So basically, I wonder what it means to colonize an environment, to entrain yourself, visit, and to um, build it into a structure that extends you. We're feeding in the pitch yaw roll heading and orientation of the drone as the pilot is flying around. So it's like he's become one with the drone. He's, he, he's over there and under the dark because he is feeling exactly what the drone is feeling. You've got a whole zoo of receptors in the skin, but really vibration is the best thing to use here. Each spot is actually a grid of nine linear resonant actuators and we can have little patterns on that so depending on the you know the 
uh, direction or the pattern on that, that tells you different information. I, I'm wondering if users do feel their body or their boundary extend. What we have here is uh, a blind participant and we have LIDAR going. And so we know the location of him and everyone else. So he's feeling where everyone is around him. On top of that, we're adding navigation. The navigation is just, you know, buzz, 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 go straight, go to the left, you know, go to 45 degrees, whatever. But the key thing is, the, 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 the amazing part is that he's feeling the location of everyone around him. That's actually better than what a sighted person has. So the Web3 is essentially a new social and economic infrastructure that we're building using software, peer-to-peer -peer networks, um, a variety of tools that are available to us that are brand new. And so the shape of our space that we live in is changing. And then he generalizes it even further to say, well, of course, we're not just talking in some linguistic space. We're interacting in a real world, in a world in which artifacts exist, things are there, we can point to them, we can click on them, we can interact about them. The practical automation of this in the context of large scale physical infrastructures is cyber physical systems. And I consider this to be sort of systems engineering cross uh, complex complexity science. And as you can see, the definition of a cyber physical system is remarkably similar to what we think of as a crypto network. I came, I, I came across crypto systems and that was the first thing that I thought, like, oh, it's a cyber physical system. I found these in a file in England that was about to be tossed out, along with a letter from Negroponte saying, Gordon, I read your paper. It's unbelievable. I think I understand it. I'm not quite sure. So it was published in a book called The Architecture Machine. And this was um, Nicholas's passion at the time. He wanted to build a collaborative environment for architects in which they used a machine, but the machine was a collaborator. So it understood goals. It understood intentions and so on and so forth. Now, Negroponte didn't have a way of oper operationalizing this. And he said to Gordon, Gordon, can you write a paper about aspects of machine intelligence? This was way ahead of its time. This was in the middle 70s or so. What's different about these other diagrams and what's here are these cross links. So before we talked about me having a goal and possibly communicating to you about the goal or me having a way I want to achieve the goal and communi communicating to you about that method. For example, could you please get me a drink of water? But what we didn't talk about is the relationship in me between the goals and the methods. Is that if I think to myself, ah, the way I'm going to quench my thirst is I'm going to walk across the room. In a way, I'm controlling my body and I walk across the room to have this drink of water. But I could equally well use you as an extension of myself and in a sense control you by not communicating to you with a level of goal and cooperate excuse me goal and cooperation but telling you what i want and telling you go please go get this thing for me it's still a command and question it's not a forcing but in a way it's still a control interaction now why would you agree to that well you might not of course and you don't have to but then there's this lovely example and all of gordon's machines are about this they're all about a dance dance teaching by a robot combining physical and cognitive human-robot interaction for supporting skill learning. So if I'm dancing with you, what happens? Well, I don't say I'd like to move to the left now. No, I push you to the left. The dance teaching robot guides the partner's motion through force interactions, decides the dance figures, and conveys them to the partner in real time. Do you get mad? No. You think, ah, he's pushing me to the left. Why? Because he has a goal. His goal is to dance with me. Ah, my goal is to dance with him. And therefore, if he pushes me to the left, I think that's his goal is the same as my goal and I'm willing to cooperate. So I respond and maybe I push him back. It then evaluates the partner's performance and modifies its guidance based on it. So this interlooping, this extension of one into the other is what fundamentally all interaction is about, at least all interaction for systems that have language for systems that have goals, and certainly human-to-human -human interactions are all about this. The student can properly learn the correct movements. The guidance force is limited for the partner's comfort. We can control the, the set of states in the on-chain system, and we can control the domain of actions, or the admissible things, the things we will let people do, and what will happen when they do it. And it incorporates the notion of control without that being a dirty word. It's part of what we do. It's who we are. It's 
It's the essence of interaction. We cannot not attempt control. Because if I put a robotic arm on the table and I give you a controller that allows you to move it, you won't be able to move it outside of the set of configurations the robotic arm allows. Because otherwise we would be spending all of our times explaining ourselves. And yet it's still okay because of the, of the consistent goals in which we cooperate. You cooperate with me, I cooperate with you, and we become one. So it's about interaction, interaction melding into one, where we're one system, one goal, a set of multiple goals, really. This isn't new at all. Actually, we've always sort of co-evolved our social and economic systems with our technological and physical systems. Finally, there's a solution for the serial spenders out there. But this one claims to be able to help you save money by giving you an electric shock every time you go over your spending limit. Yeah, and it's rubber, so it goes really tight, like in a swimming pool or something. And then I'm walking down the street, right? Here's Tom, he's got his thing. Imagine I go overdrawn, right? Oh! Interact IoT is an Internet of Things banking platform which links your bank account to different connected devices. And one of them will be the wearable Pavlock wristband. It'll send you a little electric shock every time you spend over your limit. So when we learn to build sort of certain types of bridges and roads, when we learn to build skyscrapers, but when we learn to build pretty much anything, we sort of adapted our patterns of interacting with each other. We adapted our patterns of interacting with those things. And in general, this is not a new pattern at all. And we want to stop and think about it and sort of ask ourselves what social and economic systems are emerging from our new infrastructure. Um, sleep tracking, stop a habit, alarms, various integrations as well. Now there's two ways to get other apps. You can either pay for them or when you're making progress and you're being rewarded for not falling back into your bad habits, this app will give you certain lightning bolts and then you can use that to purchase these apps. On the top right, you have the, I guess these are called the killer volts. This is what you've earned, the volts. This is what you've earned uh, so far, which you can use these to buy other apps, like I said. And then inside of that, you have the battery meter on the top right. This is your volt wallet. Except normally that we distinguish two types of sociologists those who understand social power and those who don't. And the former are called economists. And ultimately, it's an economical problem. Pavlok isn't just about breaking bad money habits, though. The band also claims it can help you quit smoking, quit eating mindlessly, and even give up gambling. And actually, infrastructure is the key word here, because infrastructure is actually very different from products. And we heard a lot about the infrastructure that we're building and how it needs to be easier and we need to understand better what it implies for us. But the thing that makes infrastructure so different from, say, a product is that infrastructure is successful when it's invisible. I think that's a nice way to think about things, yeah. More, yeah. more sociology applied to biology and physics. What uh, meditators call energy is actually compute credits that you get computed by the substrate when you're competing with other agents that want to be computed by the same substrates in your society of mind, for instance, or more generally in nature. Um, they're very associative. They associate one thing with, an, with another for reasons that aren't rational. In the same way, minds are an invariant pattern or software is an invariant pattern that we care about. We don't care about the number of transistors that implement the software. We don't care about the specific neurons that comp implement the mind because the mind is able to recruit other neurons if some of them fail. Right? So the invariance is actually the software pattern. They're very scenario oriented. They like to think in terms of a pattern that plays out that is like the, the real world. They can't separate themselves from that. Um, the, the, the thing that is so intriguing to me about this is there's no limit on the horizon, I think, to the kind of things we can plug in. And, you know, we might be able to plug in you know, an extra sense or two extra senses or three or four. Five. We don't have any idea what the limits are. The cortex is extremely good at sharing territory. This sort of triangle here where we look at economics, complex systems and systems engineering as sort of 
the points that I use to triangulate crypto economic systems. And you'll notice I've placed some edges on here because it turns out the fields I've actually worked in are closer to the edges, computational social science, operations research, and much of my PhD work was in uh, what we would consider cyber physical systems, which is a bit like applied cybernetics. So it's like a hybrid where we're automating or roboticizing systems that are larger scale in nature. Why is it better that it be neuroeconomics as opposed to behavioral economics? for what he wants to do. We did a study where we, we had people learn through trial and error to trust somebody or not trust somebody. So somebody's going to reward you, they're not going to reward you um, if you trust them in, a, in an economic exchange. And prior to the, them doing this, we then gave them a little vignette. This person is basically a good guy, nothing to do with economic behavior, but you know, kind of helps his friends out, that kind of thing, works for Teach for America. Um, you know, this guy's kind of sleazy, you know, this guy's kind of average. What we see when we do this is when you're working with the good guy, you don't use the part of your brain that seems to be responding to trial and error feedback. To use another learning and memory system when the guy is good to help you guide your choices. So how do you think it works? I actually think the argument is extremely simple, which is that you're just teaching the brain what is a real external sound. So I feel beep, beep, they're synchronized, right? Uh, and I'm feeling that, I do that just for 10 minutes a day, but the internal sound, the beep, that's fake news. That never causes a buzz on my wrist. So you're just teaching the brain what is a real sound. Real sounds always have verification. Oh, okay, that one doesn't have any verification on the wrist, so I'm going to drive that down. That's what I think is happening. We know something about how those brain systems work and what kind of information they encode and what kind of information um, they use when they're being, you know, when they're driving behavior versus another memory system's driving behavior. This now tells us something about the psychology that we wouldn't have known otherwise. We can take everything we know about those brain systems now and use that to understand why it is when it's a good guy it doesn't bother you so much that he cheats you um, you know and that's going to now go and inform our psychological model of how this could work well one of the things in the paper is that if you give somebody oxytocin they become more trustful the, it seems like the finding doesn't lead you into a place where you have a, a solution to the issue What's, how does that help us in terms of determining the person's, affecting the person's economic behavior, uh, which is what neuroeconomics hopefully will one day do, no? I'm saying our economy is a evolving cyberspace and we are changing the shape of it. And we need to actually be conscious of the fact that we're doing that and actually think about the, the ethics of engineering in our effort to, like, you know, build a new economic infrastructure. What are you gonna do, give them the hormone? No. Have a society no. hormones? No. Or we take really abstract mathematical concepts and transpose them across fields. Early work in robotics that I did involved mimicking flocking patterns to get robots to actually flock. And so we literally went into the bio biology literature and looked at the way people explained this flocking behavior, turned it into mathematical algorithms, and told robots to do it until they started to do the thing we wanted them to do. the essence of what, what complexity science is, it's, it's not really caring what the medium is, it's about the processes, the systems, the, the way that parts compose into holes and the holes exhibit properties that are not immediately inferable from the parts. Social systems are, are, are complex by nature, economic systems are social systems, and thus even as we sort of embed these social systems with new technological as I said, nervous systems, we are still actually dealing with inherently complex systems. We do get a lot of benefits from cross-mapping our observations in, in nature or in other places where emergence or complexity is the sort of defining order.